Thank you, Riaz, and thank you all so much for coming. So, like a lot of research, mine began by accident. It was sparked by chance encounters. It was 2008, seems a long time ago now, and I was a master's student at a London university at the time. And there I met a fellow student whose name was Faduma. And she really intrigued me. She was a young woman of Somali origin, and she was bright, fun, had a wicked sense of humour, and we really enjoyed hanging out with each other, and especially debating religious issues. I knew that she was devout. She wore a head-to-toe black gown. Um, she took her prayers very seriously. But perhaps naively, back then, I had no idea that she subscribed to possibly the most controversial, yet the fastest growing, Muslim faction in the country, Salafism. It was only after she brought me along to her mosque study circle that I clocked that she was Salafi and that this meant she would probably be considered an extremist by many people. It was a gathering of about 60 young women that met every week to learn about Islam in the women's section of Regent's Park Mosque, which is, of course, probably the, fam the most famous mosque in Britain. And the teacher, who was a rather formidable middle-aged woman, she told us that we needed to follow without compromise the Quran and the examples of both the Prophet Muhammad through the Hadith and what's called the Salaf, meaning the highly respected first three generations of Muslims, including the Prophet and his closest disciples, those who came after them and those who came after them. And not only that, but these literal interpretations should be applied without question to all spheres of life. And these women accepted Salafism's highly conservative teachings on things like heavy veiling, uh, wifely obedience, and seclusion from non-related men. All things that, to be quite honest with you, jarred with my liberal sensitivities at the time, and still do. And many of them wore the niqab, or face veil, as well. But as I got to know these women, I learned something fascinating. Not one of them had been raised to believe these things. It was a personal religious choice they'd all made for themselves later in life. There were born Muslims from a wide range of ethnic backgrounds, but there were also both black and white converts. I met Afro-Caribbean converts from Christian backgrounds. I met ex-Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, I met a Sikh convert, and I even met a former Catholic nun. All had one thing in common. They'd broken from the religion or non-religion of their upbringing and come to embrace Salafism, usually to the absolute unqualified horror of their parents. And I'll speak more about that later. The theological ideas that characterize Salafism are nothing new. They can be traced, let's say, back to the ninth century, but it's fairly new to the British context, becoming popular, I'd say, in significant numbers only from around about the early 1990s. And it's still today largely something you convert into, although that is starting to change, whether that's from a Muslim or indeed a non-Muslim background. And the women clearly hoped the same would happen with me. I have to say, I'm a non-Muslim. And every time I turned up at this circle, the women would often surround me and engage me in conversations about Islam. Annabelle, what do you think about this? Um, what are your doubts? What's preventing you from taking your shahada? Um, if you have any questions, just here's my number. Call me any time. While I appreciated uh, how principled and certainly determined these women were to follow what they believed, um, I have to say it was quite emotionally draining. And after a while, I stopped coming to the circles. And that was that. But then something happened that changed everything. Channel 4 broadcast a documentary, as you see here, called Undercover Mosque, The Return. And it featured secret footage of a Salafi women's circle at a London mosque. I was in for a shock. It was the very same circle that I've been attending all this time. Unknowingly, I could have been sitting next to this undercover reporter who was dressed just like the other women in full black shield barb and even niqab. She'd been coming along, hiding a camera in her billowing black gown. No one was any the wiser. She'd become a regular and she'd convinced them that she was one of them. She even got invited to people's homes for sort of private spin-off study circles and took her camera with her. The documentary's message was 
that British women are being constantly exposed to hardline Saudi teachings. They were careful to point out that the group, like the vast majority of Salafis, was utterly opposed to terrorism and jihadism, but the editors had carefully selected scenes to show women being told to separate from non-Muslims, quit their jobs if they involved mixing with men, and avoid traveling without a male guardian. Sinister background music played on throughout as well. Now, needless to say, the community was in absolute shock at the betrayal. Now, these teachings are, of course, problematic, and we can debate those and rightly should debate them, but they're not secret. I would argue Salafis are very open and proud of these teachings. And in addition to using ethically suspect methods that were, I would argue, unnecessary, this documentary presented only a partial picture of Salafis in Britain, one focused entirely on ideology rather than the women who embrace this ideology and crucially translate it into something they actually live by. And this is unfortunately typical of portrayals of Salafi women more generally. We still find they're widely written about and spoken about in the media, in political circles, in academia, but their own voices in these narratives have been almost entirely absent. In this vacuum of evidence, misconceptions flourish unchallenged. For example, it's widely accepted that many of these women, if not all of them, are passive victims of brainwashing or coercion. And it's also assumed that they follow the teachings, they follow this uh, conservative ideology without question or flexibility. And as I discovered, the evidence tells a very different story. So galvanized by this documentary, I embarked on this research with the aim of understanding these women's stories as much as I could and in their own words. And also in context beyond the mosque, uh, the formal structure of the mosque as well. An ethnographic approach therefore seemed like the best fit for me. Um, the problem was the political and media context that surrounded me made this really difficult. You know, I had to build up um, a good degree of trust in order to get the project off the ground and gain access, especially while the, while the wounds of this documentary were still, still so raw. It took me nine months before, uh, of constant going to the mosque and approaching contacts, etc., before I got anyone to do an interview. And there were times when, to be quite honest with you, I thought about giving up. But in the end, I managed to immerse myself in Salafi life for a total of nearly two and a half years. And uh, I might speak a little bit more later about the, the problems of access, but there's a, there's a chapter in my book that gives, um, uh, it's a whole chapter about the whole experience of fieldwork and uh, the issues with gaining access in such a difficult context. Unsurprisingly, Faduma's circle at Regent's Park Mosque at this point was no more. The teacher found herself banned from pretty much any mosque she tried in the whole country. So, um, like Faduma and her friends, I went looking for other Salafi spaces. I settled on Brixton Mosque in South London um, and Al Athariya, which is a group in East London. And they were my, my, my main case studies. Um, I obviously got permission from the gatekeepers. But the research took me all over the city and to people's homes, to parks, to restaurants, to shops, to chip shops, etc. as well. London is the, the biggest Salafi base in the country, uh, with about 17% of all Salafi mosques. Um, across Britain as a whole, it's estimated about 9% of all mosques are Salafi. Um, and that figure is on the rise, it would seem. The groups that I spent time with proudly use the term Salafi and are what I call quietist in orientation, um, meaning that not only do they reject jihadism and terrorism, but they also shun any formal political types of organization, things like um, political parties or associations, um, any activities like lobbying, demonstrating, and even voting as well. Instead, they focus on what's called dawah <coughs> and tarbiyah, meaning they essentially, they peacefully nurture so-called correct religious beliefs and practices in themselves as well as in others. The proselytizing aspect is really important there. So um, eventually I got 23 in-depth interviews with ordinary women, um, another 13 interviews with leaders, and I spoke to hundreds of women informally as well. These 23 women 
who I'll focus on a lot today, were aged between 29 and, uh, sorry, 19 and 29. They were well educated and they had various ethnic backgrounds, including many Somalis. And this reflects the more recent dominance of Somalis in London's Salafi community, which is really interesting. Most have been brought up in less conservative, non-Salafi Muslim families before they come to embrace Salafism and with it major lifestyle changes. So, for example, when they were growing up, they may have worn a hijab for going to the mosque or something like that, or very loosely. Um, Colours and jeans would be perfectly acceptable. But now they dressed like this. An all-enveloping black gown, a jilbab, and possibly also a face veil or niqab as well. These were mostly second and third generation Muslims whose parents had taught them a version of Islam steeped in the customs of their homelands in Somalia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nigeria, and so on. They'd sent their kids to local imams for their religious education. They hadn't really given much of that themselves. Um, and these local imams couldn't speak English. Um, they didn't really explain religious practices properly or the Quran um, in a way that the women found satisfactory. There were also women who'd been raised in non-Muslim families, um, going to church maybe, or perhaps their only interaction with any religion was going to a C of E school, something like that. But interestingly, they also felt that their religious education, their religious literacy growing up was lacking was poor, was confusing. They couldn't understand, they, they wrestled with concepts like the Trinity and said, oh, Annabelle, it's just really illogical. How can God be one and three at the same time? Um, another thing was the, the doctrine of universal salvation that some Christians were promoting to them. Um, one of my interviewees said, how can it be right that everybody goes to heaven when they die? I mean, that means I could just do whatever I wanted. It's too easy. All of the women had believed in God from a, from a young age, yet experienced this earnest sense of confusion. And when you add to this personal triggers that happened usually in their teens, um, anything from, so things going on in their lives, like um, could be the death of a, cr a close relative, it could be just having friends who were religious, um, or it could be, as it was in the case of one of my interviewees, not doing very well in her GCSEs despite working hard. And she thought, oh, God's trying to tell me something. So you add the personal triggers into the equation. And all of that drove them to look for something different and turn them into what we can call religious seekers. The mystery to me then was how and why, despite their array of backgrounds, had they all converted to Salafism in particular? Um, I, I, I think we can think of Salafism as high-risk high activism, the same way that um, other academics have described al-Mahajirun. You're not likely to get arrested for being Salafi, but you will, it does entail lots of other risks, such as alienation from friends and family, from the rest of society, Islamophobic, Islamophobic abuse. Why not choose something a bit easier to practice in a modern liberal society and less likely to alienate your loved ones? So. Here, um, to clarify, I'm using a wide definition, a wide sort of concept of conversion um, to include a whole variety of changes, not just changing from one faith system to another, which is the traditional concept of conversion. Um, also born again experiences or intra-religious conversion as well. Um, experiencing a spiritual awakening without even changing your religion at all. So nearly all Salafis in Britain are by this definition converts. Another point about conversion is it doesn't just happen in your head. It's um, something that comprises behavioral changes as well. Um, you learn by living out your new faith. And it doesn't happen in an instant or even in a linear fashion as well. It's rather an intermittent, often intermittent and long term process. It encompasses much more than singular transformative events like pronouncing the Shahada for a new Muslim, a profession of faith. Um, or an epiphany when someone realises the truth and changes their life for good, a kind of road to Damascus moment. Rather, conversion is a process, and there's an emerging consensus in the literature on this, with no identifiable beginning or end point. And this was certainly true of my Salafi ladies as well. It can take years, and it may never be completed. So 
I'll take you through now the initial stages of that conversion process, focusing mainly, as I said, on this sample of 23 young women that I spoke to in great detail. And then we'll look at what happened next in their lives as they learn to adopt Salafi behaviours and apply it to their daily lives with mixed results. So, okay, I'll change the slide. Um, around the age of 16 to 22, the women invest, well, they re resolve to invest serious effort into researching Islam and start practicing it properly. They were mostly at college or university at the time, but they didn't immediately settle on Salafism, at least um, not at first. Um, and that was really interesting to me. For some of those with non-Muslim backgrounds, this awakening coincided with their conversion to Islam. But for most, they'd already been Muslims for several years, kind of dormant Muslims, not really doing anything about it. They took their shahada and then just didn't do anything um, before they resolved to actually practice. But first, they needed reliable information about the religion. Rem remember, they came from this position of relative ignorance. Um, some were brand new converts. Um, others had been raised as Muslims, but without much detailed religious instruction. So the question was, where do you turn for that information? And they had little confidence in their parents, local imams. So instead, they turned um, to uh, Muslim friends or classmates, the college or university Islamic society, and finally, uh, my favorite sheikh, Google meaning, you know, type in Islam or Islamic talks, just see whatever comes up and hope for the best. <laughs> As you can imagine, this led them in all sorts of contradictory directions and exacerbated their confusion. Those who tried their luck with Sheikh Google found themselves inundated with information that all seemed credible. One woman called Shukri, for example, she clicked on the first link and uh, it was a sermon by the late jihadi preacher Anwar Awlaki. <laughs> I'm sure it wouldn't be the first link now, <laughs> but this was way back in like 2007 or something. So she clicked on that and then just became hooked on Awlaki's lectures for several months. As college and university students in London, the women were also exposed to a, what I call a sort of noisy religion or Islam market. Um, Lots of different Muslim groups on campus, um, competing ideas about creed, about jurisprudence, about which sheikhs you should be following and which ones you shouldn't be. Um, and their limited Islamic education left them unprepared for this. Um, they couldn't navigate it smoothly and confidently. Um, all these competing claims and counterclaims about which group was following true Islam, <coughs> who was the saved sect. Um, meaning the sect that's going to heaven when all the others are going to hell, based on a much debated hadith. Um, a quote from Shukri. Um, I could easily go to one lecture, listen to that lecture say something, go to another lecture, and that lecture I'd gone to before was now refuted, and I'd be so confused. And Amina, she said, there'll be a group of us just sitting around in a shisha cafe and we'll be talking about Islam. And a person will say, yeah, I'm upon Salafia. Yeah, I'm a Salaf, I'm this. Another says, no, but I'm a Sunni. And I'll be so confused because I was never raised in any sort of way of Islam. I was just raised as a Muslim, full stop. A lot of people will say, no, we're not going to that talk. <laughs> the Shakespeare refuted, he's not even a sheikh. And then it just started confusing me even more. And I'm like, what's this term refuted? How can someone say that about a sheikh? To me, a sheikh is a sheikh, and no one can say anything about a sheikh. Many women entered an experimental phase at this point, successively or even concurrently trying out different groups with widely varying interpretations. In a few cases, um, I found, I think about three of my interviewees were previously involved with the band group Al Mahajaroon, which was probably the most radical case of a shift. Um, and such experiments were short-lived and later deeply regretted. I'll give you some examples now. Uh, Manal, um, she experimented with Sufi, Islamist, Salafi and other groups, ex attending lectures indiscriminately and moving on every time it didn't feel right. She said, I'm at a I was at a very naive stage where I was like, okay, I'll, leave, I'll take the good and leave the bad. And Shukri also took this pick and, mix, pick and mix approach during her first year at university, listening to any person who said they're Muslim. And Warsan, who became involved with her Islamist-leaning campus Islamic society, she said, 
When you don't have that knowledge, you take from anyone with a beard. Well, what particularly interested me about this experimental phase was many of the women encountered Salafis early on and did nothing. They, they even attended Salafi lectures, but they didn't, they didn't feel anything. They didn't affiliate. They didn't join. They didn't consider themselves Salafi, sometimes for years. They didn't find it appealing. They dismissed it or carried on keeping their options open, basically. And the main reason for this, I discovered, was Salafism's reputation especially in the Muslim community, um, where it's often seen as a cult for kind of holier-than-thou types. Okay, people are going to look down their nose at you um, and say that, you know, you're a bias to tight sister or something mm -hmm. like that. And several women had felt judged and unwelcome when they first tried out Salafi talks. Um, an example of that, Abiyan described her first, encounters, uh, her first encounter with Salafis like this. They'll come up to you and be like, oh, do you come here often? And then I go to so-and-so's mosque. Oh, those, those people are deviant. Those people are this and that. And you're already being attacked. And it's like, oh my gosh, what's wrong with these people? It was just constant attack. So this goes against another idea that we often have about conversion, that there's an instant attraction upon first contact and then hunky-dory thereafter. Also, this journey of experimentation and learning wasn't linear. There were often setbacks along the way. Many women admitted that they stopped wearing their hijabs during low points. Um, sometimes under the influence of practicing friends or boyfriends, they would put them on before they were ready and then remove it when their friends did or when they broke up with their boyfriends. So it was a tumultuous period of confusion and uncertainty. How then did they become Salafis in the end? I've mentioned some of the push factors, but what was pulling them in despite um, these negative stereotypes? So first, let's look at the role of effective ties. That is having positive, warm feelings about a group's members. What was the role there? I found it was relevant, but actually quite limited in importance. Few of the women had already formed solid and lasting friendships by the time they became Salafi. Um, Several were affected by a kind of vague sense of sisterhood um, or belonging to a kind of united family of believing women um, who supported one another, worshipped together. Um, there was also a sense of coming home in some cases. So Decker had been uh, an unaccompanied child refugee from Somalia and she said she'd finally found a social space where uh, people were very nice, they were like me, they dressed like me, I didn't feel any different. And there were other similar stories. But overall, the social balance sheet, if I can say that, was negative. Becoming Salafi meant alienating yourselves from other friends, from family members, um, and not necessarily making new friends as well. Um, you they were often finding the women to be very cold and harsh and being put off and finding it a real struggle to make connections with, with Salafi women, especially at the beginning. The reaction of parents as well was often quite dramatic. Um, I even heard stories of threats of violence and even acts of violence being made by parents against their own daughters um, because they'd become Salafi and they started dressing in this way. Um, many women, as a result, hid their niqab wearing from their parents. There were lots of, I call them, secret niqab habits. That was very common. The appeal of Salafism was above all intellectual. The women were relieved to find an interpretation that supplied scripturally robust answers to all of their questions. Salafism and Salafi preachers tend to have answers and very specific detailed answers and rules for just about everything. From the big questions like what exactly happens to you after you die through to the precise menstrual conditions that make you impure for worship. They also tend to be quite painstaking when it comes to supporting their answers with scripture. And this was vitally important for these women because by this point they were all wary of trusting anyone about Islam. And this was something they could trust. The holy Islamic scriptures literally narrowly understood the Quran and the authentic Hadith. And it meant that every single rule to be followed, even if it was a really hard one, like the niqab, had been authorised at the highest level by God himself. Now, unlike other groups, 
Salafism was seen to be rigid and uncompromising. There were no concessions to West Western dress codes or parents' native cultures or theological positions that changed over time. That was a criticism of uh, ex al Mahajarun members. Or explanations prefixed with, I think. No room for opinions, or at least in theory. That phrase is banned from the Salafi teacher's lexicon. You never hear them say, I think. They said that Salafism was explained as simply what the Quran and the Salaf, or early Muslims, said. Now, of course, in reality, I have to say, it's not that simple. I was often told, Quran, Sunnah, and that's it. Um, beliefs and practices are also mediated um, through uh, human Salafi scholars uh, with their own interpretations. The major, so the major scholars will include big names like Sheikh bin Baz, um, Al Albani, and Al Uthaymeen, all of who, whom have passed away now. But these scholars, rather than, rather than the scholars being a point against the Salafis, actually the fact that they were so famous, so well respected, and especially the fact they were from Saudi Arabia or they studied there, was a big point in their favor and in Salafism's favor. Um, they, um, th there was a sort of aura of authenticity about being associated with Saudi Arabia. It was very powerful. This was the land of Islam's two holiest cities, Mecca and Medina, where Islam is enforced rigidly. And the backing of these prestigious figures, along with a, ri uh, a really rigorous approach to learning the authentic religious text, gave Salafism quite a scholastic image as well, if not a friendly and welcoming one. Salafi lessons were a bit different. For one thing, they were cheaper than those of other groups, and that was important. Um, usually they were free of charge, and at, so I was in London, they were at a, maybe a, a gym of a school in Zone 6 compared to other groups I looked at who had hired out a whole hotel in Zone 1 for a conference. Also, Salafi preachers, rather than rousing tears in their audiences over the plight of the Palestinians, for example, uh, rallying people to take action. They encouraged the women to take action on themselves, to stop sinning, to worship God correctly and devote themselves to hours of serious study of Islam's basic creed. And that was appealing to these women because they were intensely conscious of their poor religious literacy. And this meant studying the meaning of, for example, the prayers that they've been uttering since childhood but never understood and it or always got to them. Fauzia, a born Muslim, said, when I went to a, a Salafi lesson, I felt like I was actually learning with a book and a pen, and I was learning the fundamentals of the religion and proofs. In this way, the women gradually became convinced that only Salafism taught Islam purely, without corrupting it with opinions, emotion, and culture. It gave what many described as a sense of inner peace, finally finding answers to all their questions, and therefore feeling confident enough to hold their own in a debate about Islam, answer people's questions as well, which was especially important after 9-11 and 7-7 and subsequent terrorist attacks, and also confident enough to shut out the surrounding noise of other Muslim groups and friends who were associated with them. And this clear-cut scripturalism also gave them soteriological assurance that they'd been seeking since childhood, uh, meaning assurance of what to do so they can get to paradise and be sure that they are going to paradise. For example, um, Saida said that becoming Salafi was like discovering a manual, a complete set of instructions to life that, if followed exactly, guarantee the optimal result, which is paradise, of course, for all eternity. So that was the initial stage of conversion. Um, I now want to just look, um, well, first of all, I just wanted to say it's an awkward fit, isn't it, for existing conversion frameworks. It's very messy. So. I've invented a name for it. I call it delayed conversion. You actively explore, you experiment with different groups before you give one your full allegiance. And this is a form of conversion that you see in liberal, religiously diverse societies where a religious, a religious seeker is free to shop around in an Islam market or religion market before making their choice. So I now just want to talk a bit about um, what happened next. Uh, because these narratives might give the impression that once finally won over, it was just, you know, every, everything was fine and end of story. But through follow-up interviews years later and also long-term field work, I discovered that lapses in religious practice were extremely common and religious commitment could be quite fragile. So, so common were lapses that 
they'd invented a phrasal verb for it. They called it to go off Dean, to go off your religion. And this is why ethnography is so important, because it allows you to match up or see the mismatches between the self-portraits in interviews and maybe what's actually going on in the lived reality. At the mosque and study circles I attended, the women were taught a kind of black and white view of the world, I would say. Um, clearly defined rules for every sphere of life. But when it came to applying those rules, uh, the women faced disruptive realities from both within and outside the community. Many struggled to form intimate attachments to fellow Salafi women, as I mentioned, and instead they had non-Muslim friends, which was kind of against the rules. <coughs> Other Salafi women were, they complained, judgmental, fond of backbiting, and there were cultural tensions in the sisterhood. You often find cliques forming around ethnic lines. This is important to religious commitment because if you're a staunch Salafi, it entails considerable social isolation, as I mentioned. Strong relationships with fellow adherents can promote a sense of belonging to the group, comfort in difficult times, and a way of keeping alive their view, their minority view of the world and protecting it from questioning and ridicule. And Salafi men too were often seen in a negative light. They were, the women told me, uh, <laughs> in our one-to-one -one interviews, um, deceitful, untrustworthy, and even tyrannical. So many women spent years searching for the perfect Salafi husband to no avail, without much success. They suspected many men were leading double lives, one Islamic, one hedonistic, and divorce was reportedly very common. Studies of new religious movements have shown that marriage is it can be quite an important commitment mechanism as well. Um, if you marry into a group, then leaving the group means you've got a divorce and possibly leave a family behind. So it is quite important for that commitment to take place. Partly because they felt alienated by the Salafi sisters, many women would also skip Islamic study circles and mosque uh, community activities. And I was very diligently as the ethnographer going along to everything. And they would often say how impressed they were that I managed to find the time. Um, but a lot of them really struggled to do that on a consistent basis, even if it, even if it was just one circle per week, an hour a week. Um, this was also, I found, um, due to the role of the internet as well, because that had demoted the value of the teacher, the text being taught, and the physical learning experience. You could just um, tune in online on PalTalk um, from home if you wanted to, or not, and no one would know as well. That was an important thing. Um, and another reason, though, I have to say, is just a lack of inclination to put in the effort. And some of them were quite honest with me that even though this was so important for Salafis, you should be devoting yourself to serious study on a regular basis with a teacher. Um, that was just something that they didn't have time to do and didn't really, couldn't really be bothered to do <laughs> in some cases. Um, the women also faced numerous dilemmas when they adopted a Salafi lifestyle um, that occasionally would threaten to overwhelm them um, and often led to compromise. So all of the women I interviewed were pursuing, or, um, were, were pursuing either or both studies and employment. And they generally harbored career ambitions that were already quite well formed by the time they became Salafi. And not only did these other engagements take up a lot of their time, but they posed major ideological t uh, challenges. At the point when they embraced Salafism, um, they had these cherished educational and career goals, and then they later found out that actually they contradicted Salafism. This led to endless painful dilemmas. For instance, how do you get a university degree if um, interest-bearing loans are forbidden? And I know that's not just an issue that affects Salafis. Um, how do you land a job if you can't remove your veil, um, if you think it's obligatory? Um, or if you can't speak to men because you think your voice is aura, is you, you can't speak to men. Becoming Salafi could also cause heated arguments in um, families and sometimes long-term rifts, as uh, I mentioned earlier. Many parents couldn't tolerate the niqab um, or their daughters suddenly refusing to hang out with male cousins that they'd grown up with. All of the... Uh, all of the women also uh, faced a barrage of abuse on the streets. Um, on a 
quite a regular basis. If you wear the niqab, in my experience, um, those ladies, they had abuse every single day and sometimes physical as well as verbal. So in response to these dilemmas, the women devise creative solutions to render the, I the ideals uh, feasible, but some made major sacrifices and, and decisions. Four of my interviewees migrated to Gulf countries, hoping to experience fewer moral dilemmas and an easier life there. But others found ways of kind of creative, creatively adhering to the spirit rather than the letter of the, the, the law um, to make it fit for 21st century London life. Um, or they just broke it altogether, they just disobeyed it. Um, Decker, for example, was a nurse and she had to wear a uniform um, and touch male patients as part of her job, of course. But she was alarmed to discover that her that Salafi preachers she spoke to disapproved of this. She told them, though, she actually challenged them and said, if I don't work now, who's going to pay my rent? And they had no response. So she carried on as usual and rationalised it and said, well, you know, surely this is an Islamic thing. I'm helping people in difficulty. I'm also sending remittances back to my family in Somalia in poorer circumstances. Surely that's a good thing. And she carried on as before. So given the messy picture of commitment that I've just described, you might be wondering if Salafis actually defect in the end from the group. Well, Abdul Hakim Murad suggests that Salafis are vulnerable to what he calls Salafi burnout. An initial enthusiasm, usually uh, gained in one's early 20s, loses steam some seven to 10 years later. Ultimately, a majority of these neo-Muslims relapse. I think that's a little bit exaggerated personally. I think like conversion, um, disengagement is also a process and not necessarily linear, clear-cut, unidirectional. This term burnout creates a kind of dramatic impression and I've, no, I've only encountered one or two people who have totally renounced Salafism. But behavioural relapses were clearly common in the face of challenges and this could involve anything from skipping mosque classes to going out with your hair uncovered, drinking alcohol, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they no longer believed and that they'll never return. For example, some of my interviewees um, had secret boyfriends that they told me about. Um, as many as three of my interviewees got pregnant outside of marriage and had their babies. I stayed in touch with two of them and while they had, they had their moments of doubt, they had to keep a distance from their community, the Salafi community, but they still consider themselves Salafis and try to adhere to it as best they can. Disengagement can also be a gradual process that's just about settling down and getting older and having more responsibilities in life as well. Um, you finish your education, you take on additional work, family responsibilities, um, so you're more likely to reconsider your commitment to these really rigid uh, rules. Um, so I've met several middle-aged Salafis who told me how fiery and zealous they were in the, no, in, the, in the early 90s, but now they were much more relaxed about things like mixing with men and watching TV. So what emerges from this picture of conversion? I found no evidence of coercion or so-called brainwashing, first of all. On the contrary, I found that the Salafi uh, conversion process was in many ways intellectual rather than based on social or other pressures. But such pressures, moreover, aren't necessarily irresistible where they do occur, and that's really important. Rather, often the social pressures were the other way around, from parents horrified at their daughter's transformation. And even once <laughs> brought into the Salafi community, women were not unwavering in their religious commitment, far from it. Overall, the picture I've painted for you today is a complex and messy one of everyday lived religion. It's a picture of surges and lapses, experiments and reappraisals, adaptation and compromise, contradiction and disobedience, intermittent bursts of religious practice and retreats, and gradual disengagement as life goes on. It's a far more dynamic, complex and human picture than the essentialist ones often suggested by media stereotypes on the one hand, but also Salafi preachers and texts on the other. Thank you. <laughs>